Hi, this is Claudia Gray, and you're listening to the FSF Podcast. The show where the main characters don't have enough plot armor to withstand lightsaber stabs. Our show is brought to you by our charity sponsor, the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund, which supports the Wish Upon a Teen Foundation that helps out sick kids when they need it most. And just imagine the comfort you'll give Red Shirt Crewman number 2008. She'll know that when she puts on the red shirt and joins the crews of the Enterprise in their struggle against the editors, that she didn't leave her family destitute and without hope because the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund has her back and what's left of her typewriter. All right, guys, our guest today is a very popular author who's written, well, uh, many books in the Star Wars community. And they're not just character stories, you know, uh, like for Princess Leia and some others, although there are some Princess Leia stories in there. That's that's definitely a thing. But also she has some of the canon forming books for the High Republic, but she also specializes in some, with some YA titles and with series such as Spellcaster and Evernight. And uh, if you haven't caught on to who we're talking about yet, I'm stupid excited about this. I know Kathleen is as well. We are so proud and excited to welcome Claudia Gray to the FSF podcast. Welcome to the show, Claudia. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So uh, after, you know, we talked with your agents and they said, yes, that date would work. And Claudia would love to come on the show. Um, We call it research. Others may call it digital stalking. But that's when that began. And we started looking into you. We started doing more history. We knew we knew enough about you at that point where we knew why we wanted to talk with you. But we knew that we also needed to do a little bit more research, right, to make sure that we had uh, all the I's dotted and the T's crossed. And the umlauts. Don't forget the umlauts. Well, there's always umlauts. You got to find them. All right. So I found a small bio. uh, that said prior to you becoming a writer uh, that you worked as a lawyer, a journalist, a disc jockey. And my favorite part was it says an extremely poor waitress. And yes. that amused me. So I have a two part question for you, Claudia. Okay. Number number one, uh, just how bad of a waitress were you? I mean, like are people still waiting for their coffee and pie type of bad waitress? And number two, <laughs> how did those past lives influence your current work? Um, I I don't think I was terrible, uh, but I fell beneath the standards of professionalism required at Applebee's. So there Uh you go. Um, yeah, I mean, it was things like, you know, I was okay with handling the, the customer service part of it, but handling all the chaos back uh in the kitchen and the different digital menus and the rib baskets were one place one day and then they'd be on a new menu the next day and i'm still very scarred by what was in fact a very short period in my life but (laughs) uh but yeah i i would say it was a solid like c minus all right uh something like that uh, and how does it uh, inform this? I mean, uh, being a lawyer, obviously it helps with contracts um, and it puts um, some kind of deadline work in perspective because uh, it's a lot. And um, But mostly it makes me very, very grateful to be doing something that's a lot less confrontational uh let's see i was a disc jockey but i think sometimes people who don't know me think that that might be the cool kind of disc jockey uh people who know me realize better uh this is on radio not like in a club or anything yeah and radio djs at least back in the day there there were two main flavors you had jocks and announcers Mm -hmm. jocks were funny and their personality was part of it and announcers like me were like next up roseanne cash you know like that it was a country music station so uh that was that was what i did there uh mostly that has left me with a really strong amount of knowledge about three years of country music and and not much since unless it's by dolly parton um yeah and then what else? Journalism. Journalism is very good about making you write, making you get a lot less precious about writing and edits. I think a lot of us starting out, certainly me, it's like, oh, and I've lit a candle and I have my string lights up and now I'm in this 
really amazing mood and I'm listening to the soundtrack and now I can write and uh, you, you have to get over that in the end. Um, and uh, journalism, you know, if you're going to have something by deadline, you're, you're going to make that happen. And also the, the main two edits you always get in, in journalism are add more information and make it shorter. So uh, it makes you be concise and tight, or at least gives you the capacity to be. That's not always the right way to go with something, but it, it's a good mode to have handy. Does that make sense? No, that does. That makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, so not, I'm by no means comparing myself in any way, but I, I started freelance writing recently. And mm -hmm. so when I, my first couple articles were these like, public speaking diatribes of of all the useless knowledge that I thought I had to share with somebody and my, my editor the first first article is like you know um I don't want to rain on your parade real nice article um uh, you know you, you you built it properly you you you, you know you've found out you know uh, I was able to find out all the information I needed to find it could have been about half that size though mm -hmm. you know it's like, so maybe, you know, cut back the words. And I was like, oh, okay, no problem, no problem. So my next article, I wrote another one. Hey, doing a really good job. <laughs> Built it properly. You know, all the information makes sense. Could stand to be a little bit shorter, though. So, yeah, you know. it's always add, add more information, make it shorter. One of the two, usually both. At the same yeah. Time. So I'm I'm still kind of learning kind of feeling my way around all that stuff but it's it's fun i i do enjoy writing didn't think i would never thought i'd be want to be a writer of any at any uh of any stripe but yeah but i and yet it's found you somehow some way and now i'm like ooh, what's the next thing i can write about so that seems to be how that works though is it it bites you and then you can't get rid of mm -hmm. it so, I mean, talking about your writing, which obviously is why you're here, most of our listeners are going to recognize you from your work with Star Wars. One of your recent titles that definitely caught my attention and then was quickly added to my hold list at the library was The Murder of Mr. Wickham. Oh, yes. I have always loved Jane Austen, so the idea of continuing the stories that she began definitely interests me. So what has inspired you to dive into the world of Jane Austen and add murder to the mix? Uh, let's see, I've, I've long been a Jane Austen fan and uh, an Agatha Christie fan. Mm. Um, and, I mean, I think Agatha Christie actually came first, but uh, both of those have been things that I have loved a lot over the years. And, um, you know, when I got married, I, I found the guy who was a bigger Jane Austen fan and <laughs> a Christie fan than me. So, um, you know, the two of us have read a lot of stuff together and watched a lot of stuff together uh, in April uh, when we went to the UK for Star Wars Celebration. I finally got to go to both Bath and go around oh, uh, some God. of the places where Jane Austen was and, and set some of her books. Uh, and we got to go see the mousetrap in uh, in London, which I think it's in it's something like it was somewhere between seventy seven thousand performances mm -hmm. it was in that thousand mark, and it was sold out. So that number will not stop growing anytime soon. Anyway, I loved these things for a long time, and then I wound up having the idea for this. It took shape over a pretty long period of time. Usually I know whether an idea is going to turn into something or not. I would say usually fairly soon, but before this, the longest had been on the outside about two years. And this I kept playing with for the better part of a decade. And for a lot of that time, I thought, well, I'll probably just do it as fan fiction or something. Mm -hmm. Um, but then finally in, uh, late 2019, I was telling somebody about it, a writer friend and they said, oh yeah, that one. And I realized I've been talking about it too long. If I don't write it now, it's going to turn into one of those things that never gets written. And now I am suddenly in a murder mystery series that is going to have at least four books. So, uh, I am delighted by that. It has been so much fun to write. I don't think I'm the only huge nerd who 
was like the really bookish kid who spent a lot of study hall reading novels from the 19th century. I, I think that, yeah, that happened to a lot of us. And I was like, wow, you really see it. Because when I was trying to write, you know, Austin-esque of that period, I was like, oh, in some ways this is easier to me than, than like normal normal 21st century human narration <laughs> my brain imprinted really strongly on that so uh it has been a delight I mean I can't work the way that she works obviously her writing ability she's one of the great geniuses of mm -hmm. the English language I'm just trying not to embarrass myself <laughs> uh, in that light but it's great because it's she's so witty so you're allowed to be funny, even about some of the darkest and most emotional things. Um, and there are some traits of the way things were written then that I still, that I can work with now that you don't get to mm -hmm. with modern books. Like, for instance, head hopping. You know, now that's like a fiction no, no, no. You have to pick one character and you're with that character through the scene. Uh, in older books, the omniscient point of view is is actually pretty common. And so I started trying that out and I realized like, oh, this is fantastic for comedy. You get to play different people's perceptions off each other the whole way through. This is great. Uh, or I was trying to sort of shorten scenes or make them a little bit more, you know, quote unquote, dynamic. But that's not how scenes began in novels from the early 1800s. Right. You circle the scene first and kind of settle into it and do that. But I realized, like, oh, that actually really lets you set a mood in a different way, um, set things up plot-wise in a new way. You know, it's a really great set of tools that I was sort of like, why Why do we assume these are necessarily lesser? I you know, they, they're old fashioned, but they have real utility and it's been a joy riding with them. So you have two out currently, correct? Mm -hmm. And you said that there's at least four that are going to be in that one? Yes, I finished the third book and in a couple months here, I'll get to work on the fourth. I already know roughly what's going on there, but uh, with murder mysteries, there's a whole different level of plotting right. that has to come into it, which, like, I knew it. I knew that going in. I'd been a mystery fan for a long time, and I'd mm -hmm. read, you know, notes from other writers, but it's one thing to know something like this, and it's another thing to have your creative imagination respond to it. Like when I did my first graphic novel, I knew, let the pictures tell the story. It doesn't all have to be in the words. I knew this, but I was well into my first draft before that actually began happening. Mm -hmm. My imagination started creating in terms of images. It was like, okay. Uh, and with Murder Mysteries, I knew, one, everybody's lying about something. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and they that lie has to be as important to them in that way as the murder was to the murderer. You know, you have to have all these cross currents. You can also have a few lighter ones or funnier ones in there, but you have to set that up. And in every single scene, there's kind of going to be a lie and a truth that have to be in operation. Pretty right. Much. And I knew that, but it was really plotting the third book that made it come clear to me. And thank goodness I was still doing edits on the second book. And I was like, don't freak out, but I'm going to work with this again. And went back to it and everything fell into place so much, so much differently and more easily, which was great. So um, I feel like I'm free associating here. Please forgive me if I'm no, rambling. But uh yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of fun to do. I very much hope that it will go beyond even four books. Mm. That'd be cool. cool. Yeah, it would. It would. So I had forgotten to tell my wife and daughter, who are both voracious readers, um, like my daughter last year read 220 some odd books, a lot of YA titles. She's wow. she's read your series. Um, and, and I and I forgot about this. So I while you were giving your answer to Kathleen, I, I quick went to Amazon on my phone and I sent the link to my wife and my daughter. And my wife says, oh, yeah, I own that. I love that book. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Fantastic. My wife, feedback happening. 
exactly. My wife is a huge uh, Jane Austen fan, and so, um, so yeah, when your when your stuff came out, uh, yeah, she started into that because she's like, oh, something in the Jane Austen world. This is going to be fantastic, and yeah, so she loves it. So yeah, that's another of the fun parts. Is I mean, each book is a is a mystery, but there are also many sequels. You know, a lot of times, because I'm far from the only person who's written a mystery in the Jane Austen world, and I'm sure I'm not the only person who's done what I'm doing, but it's rarer. A lot of times people show up, the characters show up, and they're just playing the roles in the mystery so mm-hmm. much. Whereas hopefully each of these books is as much sequel and we're revisiting the characters and something that feels true and important about those characters is still in play. And And I feel like that's very true to Jane Austen because she was very smart about human nature. Mm -hmm. I mean, those books still ring true and are funny, Mm -hmm. you know, more than 200 years later. I mean, there are jokes from 10 years ago (laughs) that don't work anymore. Her stuff is still spot on. And part of this because she understands people so well. And I think she knew like, we don't, we don't get over our flaws. We get smarter about them. Right. It may take more to push us into something where that flaw comes into play, but they're still there. So mm-hmm. uh, it's about saying, okay, where are these characters who are now wiser and older and have gone through more mm-hmm. experiences, but they're still the same people. They're still vulnerable. What, what pulls out something interesting for Colonel Brandon or, uh, or you name it. Mm. Anna, Thank you, Anna. Anna. Sorry. Thinking about her writing, though, and her her humor, I actually just recently we had potatoes for dinner and my husband's like, oh, these are really good. I'm like, are you telling me that these are excellent boiled potatoes? And he's like, man, you're weird. I'm like, oh, you know exactly what I'm quoting. Don't even try. (laughs) (laughs) But I I actually saw that. I saw it on a shirt the other day, too, with the what excellent boiled potatoes. I'm like, oh, man, I just I need that. (laughs) <laughs> that in my life. The, the thing that's really amazing about her is she slips these you know sometimes there's just this dagger of both humor and insight mm-hmm. there'll be several on a couple of pages but the thing is she never stops the story to have that the prose never feels like she's interrupted it right to tell a joke it's part of the way that she works it flows just absolutely smoothly and and just her word choices are so precise like one of my favorite things in sense and sensibility and it's just a little moment the very sensible eleanor dashwood is meeting with robert ferrers who is a a very arrogant fatuous trivial sort of person and he's going on and on about something completely ridiculous and i believe the line is something like eleanor nodded and agreed with all that he said for she declined to pay him the compliment of rational opposition Mm -hmm. and just think about how devastating that is on so many (laughs) levels and it's just a drop and the scene keeps going Mm -hmm. yeah she's got to say that old English insults are far better than a lot of the ones that we get today That's and the true. way that they're worded and how they're brought up. I just, some of them are just really cool. Like that. The, the, My right. favorite insult of all time happened uh, in the 1800s in parliament. Uh, somebody was telling one speaker, you know, he thought so little of him. He said, I only ask whether you will die of the pox or on the gallows and the guy said that depends on whether i embrace your principles or your mistress <laughs> yep. oh goodness <laughs> yeah like for, for absolutely scathing comebacks in short order i don't see how you beat that i really no don't. that's pretty fantastic yeah oh great uh on a side note one of the things that my my wife and daughter also watch uh i think they're on i think it's on youtube i don't know if it's on any, if it's anywhere else but uh, they absolutely love the Lizzie Bennett diaries. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they are absolutely addicted to those. They watch those all the time as well. And I I said something to my wife the other day, and she, speaking of uh, very quick, scathing comebacks. Um, <laughs> oh, oh. So I was like, I was like, you're watching that again? And she looked at me and goes, uh, how many times have you watched Star Wars? 
Point taken. Moving along. Uh, Rude, Shana. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I'm here rewatching both of those things obsessively. So, excellent. And now, a word from our show sponsor, Level Up Savers. Their link can be found in the show notes. So, uh, Claudia, I read somewhere that prior to your writing full time, and you mentioned this just a moment ago, uh, that, that you weren't sure if this novel was going to be something you'd publish or if it would just be fan fiction. But you, you'd mentioned that uh, or the article mentioned that you had written several fan fiction stories. And that was how you felt got you yourself ready for being an author and writing for publication. So whether you wrote those stories for your own purposes or as attempts to get yourself really into writing, how do you think that, that writing those style of the style of fan fiction helped you become the author you are today? Uh, first, I just think it is so dear that you said you wrote several fan fiction stories, like seven or eight or something, <laughs> you know, and that was a really big part of my life for what, more than 20 years Right. You yeah. Know, uh, there, so I just threw there, it in several. <laughs> there, there, there was so much. There was so much. Um, I mean, in a lot of ways, it, it's easier to talk about what I didn't write than what I did. Um, but, uh, you know, I didn't do it deliberately going, oh, I will become an author for this. Okay. That was not what I was thinking. Uh, even though being an author was something I had always idolized in my head it took me a very long time to think well maybe I could actually do it you know it seems mm -hmm. sort of like fantasizing about being an Olympic figure skater you know that's nice but um you know that is not open to everybody and of course that is actually far more difficult to do than being an author but um you know I I wrote because the reason that you write fanfic is you have to, you know, you, you, you have to, you feel driven. Uh, all fan fiction is on some level a dialogue with the original source. Um, you know, something that somebody might say in say a nonfiction essay, mm -hmm. um, you can maybe say just as well in an alternate universe fan fiction or uh, something like this. Um, even when you do alternate universes where you take the characters and put them someplace completely different, I saw online, they said all the, um, all the media out there that's about like cute, happy people who work in a coffee shop. The fan fiction is all about them being in a post-apocalyptic war. <laughs> and all the media that's about the post-apocalyptic war is about those people running a coffee shop. You know, it just moves them back and forth. But but it does make you ask yourself, you know, what is fundamental to this character? How do I recognize this post-apocalyptic warrior working in a coffee shop? What what are they like? What would still be true about this person? Which is a fun question to ask. Um and while I wasn't building my own worlds, I was playing with world, other fictional worlds other people had created, which, if you're really paying attention to it, teaches you a lot about what makes a good universe and uh, how you can expand a concept or how maybe you get a little bit too far away from it in, in some other ways. So um, that was the single biggest thing was it just made me really really concentrate on the fiction i loved whether that was a book or a comic or a television show or a movie it made okay. me really concentrate on that from a creative point of view and you know and also i mean before i wrote any novels i just thought how would you even make up that much of a story like how 
how, how do you get all of that together? And then I had my first novel length fan fiction idea. And it was like, oh, literally you just keep making stuff up. That that's that's all that that is. <laughs> it's, it, it, there's not some sort of mysterious scrying thing that happens after thirty thousand words. You just you just keep going. And once I had written. 90,000 words that had a beginning and middle and an end and some subplots, et cetera. Um, I kind of knew the heft of that, if that makes sense. And that's mm-hmm. actually a big, big thing that fan fiction gives you if you write it, because fan fiction can be any length. You know, right. it can be it can be a 100 word drabble. You know, I think there are a million word fanfics out there that have mm-hmm. just kept going and going and going. It's however long it is but you begin to get a sense of how much story you have when you start working with something. And I know a lot of aspiring writers get really thrown because it's very early, very easy early on to think you have a plot when what you have is a premise. Okay. And, um, you know, fanfic sort of taught me to go, okay, that's, that's a really interesting thing to play with. That's not quite a book. What else would it need to become that? You know, okay. uh, it gave me a sense of that as well. Okay. So thinking about that, you, you mentioned, you know, uh, for the number of years that you did, you said it was easier to write, talk about the ones that you didn't write. And I'm not going to ask you which ones you didn't, but it was there any one uh, like universe or fan fiction area that you, you found it, difficult to write in and it really other than jane austen where you you, you went for you know uh, a better part of a de- decade trying to write the story was there one that, uh, you, that, actually, that oh yeah no that 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 wasn't i didn't really try for a decade it was there for a decade with me playing with it but i wrote right. some jane austen fan fiction uh among some other things uh which was fun but um what was harder um Definitely the first time I went, because a lot of the early stuff I wrote would be paranormal in some sense. You know, I got in from the X-Files and, um, you know, you had, you had Charmed and you had Buffy and Angel and you had things like this. And the first time I tried to write something that was science fiction instead of magic, I was like, oh, okay. It's not that you can't have convenient devices, et cetera, et cetera, to help you out in science fiction, as we all know, but it has to at least feel like a scientific device or principle or something. Oh, sure. Yeah. And okay. it, and it's harder, or at least it was for me. For some people, it might not be, but I was like, oh, okay, you, you have to do this differently. You know, I've researched the heck out of so many different things just because I loved the the show or the book you know uh and mm-hmm. that was really great you know i did not know much of anything about spies at one point but uh that is no longer true <laughs> 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 um at all which uh was interesting uh, and actually through writing fiction i got to know a guy who really was a spy for a while um how cool is that it was cool. Well, he, I mean, he made it very clear. He was like, 95% of that job is doing research at a desk, you know, but they, you know, there was another 5% that was like wearing a disguise in Islamabad type uh, of stuff going on. How cool so, is that? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So th- that was very interesting to learn about. Uh, and actually, that was one of the things I enjoyed about law as well. Like, you get all these little different windows to look through and examine the world. And I loved doing more research beyond just what the, the movie or book or show was presenting, like going and getting more knowledge for that. But right. one of our good friends, Anna, from the podcast Growing Up Skywalker, was super excited for us to be talking to you. And she actually wanted us to ask like which moment, duper. what? Like super duper. Super duper. Like there was there was squealing. It was adorable. She may have been she may have been giddy. Very giddy. <laughs> she wanted to know though which moment you're most proud of being able to portray for one of your heroines. And while I'm sure she has Star Wars in mind, you're free to expound on any of your other characters as well. Ooh, that's a really great question. And I don't think I've ever had it before. Ooh. Yeah. Let me think. Wow, there's a few different things. Um the dimension hopping series, the Firebirds 
series that started with A Thousand Pieces of You. I really, really enjoyed writing that heroine, Marguerite, quite a lot uh, for a lot of reasons. But and this is not the kind of answer that they were looking for, but it was actually hugely important. Um, In the book, she's chasing her father's killer through alternate dimensions, and she always Mm -hmm. appears in another version of herself. So she's seeing all these other lives she might have led. And I had one in the third book where she appears in a universe where she is deaf. And so I did some research, you know, and went online and spoke with people who had had sudden, you know, extreme hearing loss. It's sort of like what surprised you, what was different, et cetera. And one person uh, said, well, there's going to be um, quite possibly some audio hallucinations. And I was like, what? And he goes, well, right at first, you know, he goes, deafness is not silence most of the time. Uh, he said, for a lot of people, it's more like just white noise that nothing ever comes quite clear from. And he said that happened with him, but his um, his brain would try to make sounds out of what it had. And so it would just fill in the missing information. And he'd be like, mm. oh, I hear a waterfall. No, I don't. That was a car driving by, you know, things like that. Um, and the reason that I'm really, really glad I wrote this was it's so strange. But right as that book was coming out, I suddenly lost about a third of my hearing in this ear. I mean, overnight. Okay. It just happened. Um and, uh, you know, the doctor was like, yes, this will probably continue to happen. But I was like, oh, that's fantastic. It hasn't gotten any worse since. So, but anyway, that happened. And I would have thought I was having some kind of mental breakdown if I had not known about audio hallucinations, because that happened quite a lot. Oh, you wow. Know? Okay. I would never have known that or even thought to suspect it if I had not been doing that research for that character so that has to come first that was something that was really glad I got to portray because it wound up providing some guidance for me uh as as you know this happened uh let's see I mean for Princess Leia I mean that's one of the big heroines that I've gotten to write the most in Star Wars um I really like the moment both in Bloodline, I like both the moment that the fact that Darth Vader is her father is made known to the galaxy mm-hmm. uh, and the way that she feels about that in that moment. And then there's a moment later in the book where, I mean, we know throughout it that she's not at peace with Vader in the way that Luke is. Luke got to see the change and speak to Anakin. You know, he he got that experience. Leia got tortured. That That's what she has of yeah. that. And there's a moment in it where she suddenly, like, she's really, really angry about an injustice. And then it hits her for the first time. She was like, with Anakin Skywalker, it could have begun like that. He could have been angry about something that was legitimately wrong and let it go away. And it's not total peace with Anakin, but it's the first time she's allowed herself to kind of see, like, it could have begun in a good place. You know, he could have been this good person that she's heard about. She sees how those things link up. Uh, I liked being able to do that quite a lot. Uh, and um, my favorite thing I've gotten to write in the Jane Austen stuff is actually in the third book, and I can't talk about that yet. But one thing that I loved, and it was not in the first draft, it didn't come until later drafts, but you know, the first book, The Murder of Mr. Wickham, has characters from all six of Jane Austen's published novels. Mm-hmm. And one of them is Fanny Price from Mansfield Park, who is by 21st century lights, not somebody we would have as a heroine at all. She's very timid. She's very physically fragile. She's very pious. Um, she, she has a lot of difficulty um, advocating for herself. The whole thing about Mansfield Park is she takes one stand, exactly one, and she sticks to it. And she's mm-hmm. right. But it is not an easy thing for her to do. Um, 
But of course, her most famous heroine is Elizabeth Bennet, who becomes mm-hmm. Elizabeth Darcy, who is very funny, very much a self advocate, um, very, very, uh, very bold character even today, but certainly by the standards of that time. And those characters interact. And there's actually a scene where Fanny is sort of realizing, you know, she thought Elizabeth was this very indelicate woman. And uh, the two of them are sort of realizing they're not that different. They're different in how they present themselves, but in the way they actually see the world and try to navigate the world uh, in some core ways, they have something in common. That was fun to do. Sounds awesome. Very great. Like, yeah. sorry, the murder, the, um, Mr. Wickham is like literally waiting for me to go pick up at my library tomorrow. And oh, fantastic. I am so excited for it. <laughs> Great. I hope you will have, if you have even half as much fun reading it as I had writing it, you will have a good time. So I am I hope so that. excited. So there it is, Anna. Hope you like those answers. I thought those were really cool. Were I re- actually, the the my favorite one. Uh, I wanted to say that it was Princess Leia, just because I've always I've always loved the story of the descent of Anakin and how he got to where he was at and what mm-hmm. made him tick and and you know uh, all the all the outside influences that were manipulating his mind and his thoughts and all these different things. Yeah. Uh, but I also like seeing that from, from different vantage points, especially, uh, you know, from this angle, from one of his children and, yeah. you know, the, the anger the, that she would have had because of that. And I don't think that's something that, that gets talked about very much. So I wanted it to be that answer, but I really did think that your hearing loss story was really cool. So we're going to go with that one. That was my favorite. <laughs> all right. So Claudia, one of the questions I absolutely love to ask anybody that's related with star Wars, because I am a longtime Star Wars nerd. Star Wars is mm-hmm. extremely, extremely important to me in my life and, and what I do. I'm not saying it, Kathleen, shut up. And uh, you like his marriage. See, I don't have to say it because you'll say it for me. <laughs> what? Your marriage? <laughs> I used to say, and, and then she started mocking me for it. When when people would ask me what I why I what I felt about Star Wars, I always say it's like my marriage. It's been there for me in good times and bad and sickness and in health. It's Star mm-hmm. Wars is always there. Just like my wife is always there. I, she's always there for me. As long and as your she, wife has no problem with that, I say go with it. She doesn't because she knows she knew what she was getting into. She knew she was a nerd. I was a nerd. So it is what it is. But one of the questions I always love to ask people about Star Wars, be, because it is my favorite fandom. Um, and when it comes to your personal fandom, when did you become a fan of Star Wars? And you know what drew you into the universe? And what really keeps you coming back? Um, I turned seven in the summer of 1977. Okay. So I was ground zero in terms of kids who had this come in and just take over your imagination, you know, in a way that almost nothing else has ever matched. And I really feel like, you know, it shows my age, but you know, the monoculture is gone now. There, there isn't, I, I think younger people have a lot of difficulty understanding how big something that was big then really was, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it was everywhere. It was everywhere all the time. It was popular like oxygen, you know, it was <laughs> huge, you know, and this is before you had, um, you know, um, video stores even much less streaming services you know they they issued posters that were showing that star wars had been in theaters for a year it was Mm -hmm. still selling out theaters after a year now we're really impressed if a movie you know like barbie made it four weeks at number one and everybody's like i can't even imagine this you know Right. right like um you know, it was mammoth. And so, you know, we got some of those first toys that we should have kept and retired on, but did not instead mm-hmm. play very hard and had them chewed on by our dogs. Um, you know, it was always, always, always a part of my creative vocabulary and my, my fanishness. You know, I've read a bunch of the old EU books from uh, when they began Till I went to graduate school about 10 years after they started publishing. And then the workload was so much that I kind of fell behind. 
And I still read some things, particularly right around the time, um, you know, like some of the Young Jedi stuff, um, Mm -hmm. et cetera. But, you know, before it had been virtually everything I read. Um, You know, went to see the prequels. I did not camp out for prequel tickets, but I did stand outside in a line, I think, for five hours or something um went to go see the phantom menace with a friend they cosplayed as obi-wan there were other people there cosplaying and cosplaying was a rarer hobby then yeah but he was there but he looked a little weird we're like do you feel okay and he's like wait anyway the lights went down he put on glow in the dark body paint so he was force ghost i love that (laughs) it was pretty (laughs) epic it was pretty epic. Oh, Back then, the glow in the dark paint wasn't as great. Like after thirty minutes, he was less shiny, which actually might have been annoying. So okay, but you know, so that happened. Uh, you know, and I am still a fan and still love this. I mean, uh, you know, I'm I'm warning you now. We're going into really dangerous territory because I loved Andor so much. Like, the way I've been telling people, like, I feel about Andor the way Qui-Gon felt about Anakin. You know, like, the oh. one who's come. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's here with us now. Um, you know, and I would not trade that for anything. That That is just such a source of, of joy to be able to tune into. You know, do I feel the same way about all of it? No. We, you no. also do not want me to talk about the Book of Boba Fett. Um, you know. But is there always stuff there that I do love and am fascinated by? Yes. Oh, that's great. And I, I think that that's a, a mark of a true fan who can, who can, and I hate to say true fan because that just makes me sound like every douche nozzle on the, on the internet. Um, but I think if you can have a realistic view of the things that you like and, and not, and be willing to not crap on them and just be like, yeah, that wasn't my favorite, but I'll move along to, and I'll, I'll pay attention more to the things that I do like. I think that's always a mark of a really good fan, somebody who understands well, and, where they're they're at and what's going on. But that was also a thing that I think kind of came out of, again, back when you had the monoculture and you had TV shows that had 22 to 25 episodes a year and things were more episodic generally. They mm-hmm. weren't all going to be good. You know, I watched Star Trek The Next Generation on its initial thing. There's barely a good episode, you know, there's like three good episodes in the first two years of that show. Um, And then, of course, it got really great, but they would still every once in a while have a clunker and you just went, Mm -hmm. oh, well, that's a clunker. Or the X-Files, you know, some weeks you get to see Vince Gilligan discovering himself as a screenwriter and doing something brilliant. And the next week it's the Chupacabra. You know, and you're just like, well, this week's a chupacabra week, I guess. You know, uh, Boba Fett, Book of Boba Fett was my chupacabra with uh, I struggled with it. I liked it, but I struggled with it there. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that's somebody's favorite Star Wars TV show, and I'm sure the chupacabra episode is somebody's favorite X Files episode out there. Well, there's there's like people who love absolute love Phantom Menace. I am not one of those peoples. Mm -hmm. Um, I really struggled with Phantom Menace. I, you know, and, and a lot of things, one of the things I love most, and I, we've talked about this with our guests too, but one of the things I love most about doing this show is that we get to have different perspectives mm-hmm. and have people's perspectives help flavor my opinions because I try to look at it, things through their their eyes and, and how did this person see it and, and things like that. Because now, for instance, I absolutely despised, hated, uh, was ready to riot uh, over uh, the solo movie. Mm. And... Because now for for context, Han Solo is my favorite character. Mm-hmm. Uh, Harrison Ford is my all time favorite actor. Mm-hmm. One of my son's middle name is Harrison. Oh, uh, so, <laughs> you know, I had a little bit I had a little bit of a draw to that movie. And I, I I don't remember even out of the 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 sequel trilogies, uh, the rest of the prequel movies, anything else. I have never left the theater upset. I was so mad when I left that movie. I mean, just mm-hmm. angry because <laughs> there was just there, that's a, that's a whole other story. But anyway, no, we, we had I a mean, guest. You know, I was very um, middle of the road on that. I was like, I find this, you know, very slight and amusing. It is not the story I would have told about Han Solo, you know. Um, but 
I, honestly, my expectations were really low because I kind of felt like nobody but the suits wanted a young Han Solo. Um, you know, so I was like, oh, well, okay, all right. Um, and I was mostly buoyed up by um, the presence of Donald Glover as Lando. Oh, he uh, rocked it. He was yeah. fantastic. I was like, we needed yeah. a Lando movie and we could have had yeah. Han Solo uh, in it. Yeah. Uh, he, him? Uh, Donald Glover and, oh, and, I and Lando, and yeah, oh yeah, she was awesome. And I also really, really enjoyed Amelia Clark as, as Kira. Yeah, I thought she was very good. And actually, at the the only thing I wanted to see out of that movie is I wanted to see what happened with Kira when she left to go meet up with Darth Maul. When that yeah. was done, that was like, okay, okay, show me that, give me that movie, and I, I would have been thrilled. Mm -hmm. But. Yeah, uh, I, I... I've said multiple times what they should have done is written a movie that was about the Star World Star Wars underworld in that era and then said where does Han Solo fit into this where mm -hmm. does Lando fit into this you know if they'd had a like here's why we're here other than it's Han but younger like it, it would have gone a whole lot better yeah sorry now we're just fan fan talking but that's okay I'm enjoying that too uh yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so I, I've had to come around on that movie. There was a couple things that were shared with me, and it, it did help me change my opinion slightly. I mean, I'm not, I'm no longer angry with the movie. I just, but, you know, I don't go out of my way to watch it. I should yeah, well, during I mean, that one. Yeah, I mean, I I was okay with the Phantom Menace, mostly because I love Qui Gon so much. Mm -hmm. um, but Attack of the Clones is one that you know. I, I get through about once every 10 years and then I get angry each time, you know, <laughs> because um, one, it made a whole lot of people in Star Wars go, I hate romance in Star Wars. We don't need romance in Star mm -hmm. Wars. And like, sometimes these people have icons of Han and Leia and I'm like, wait, no, you just, you got burned ones. That, that's what we happened. We do there. need romance in Star Wars. You we need just romance. Need you just better dialogue. It well, just needs to be written better. Yeah, you know, better flirting than floating pears. But the the reason that, you know, it made me angry is that's what we're given to invest in Anakin with. Mm -hmm. you yeah, know, like that's the majority of it. We also have what happens to his mother, but even that gets shoehorned into a pretty small segment. Yeah, uh, of the movie. And if that's all you have to get people to love Anakin Skywalker, when we've been hating him for a whole long time as Darth Vader and you drop that ball that's a significant drop mm -hmm. but you know I really felt like the Clone Wars did such a better job we had more time with Anakin and you got to see him be yeah. you know brave and wise and forthright and yet a little arrogant a little impatient a little you know? unhinged um, at times yeah and then you got yeah, to mourn you know, the loss um, of your friend instead of just being mad like yeah you needed more time with that character and they tried course, to yeah. put all of it on a romance and then they did the romance very poorly so yeah. that's the thing that i still get all oh. yeah, yeah clone wars absolutely saved anakin uh his mm -hmm. storyline yeah absolutely Mm -hmm. I will say, like like I said, I I fell asleep during Han Solo or during the Solo film, but then I also remember that the Solo film came out in 2018 when I it came out in May of 2018, so I was four and a half months pregnant at that point. Like it came out in theaters then, and then when it was available for digital streaming, I had a newborn. Like it was the that's why I fell asleep because I was exhausted. <laughs> you're Fair making enough. a person out of leftovers oh Hi. gosh <laughs> totally true <laughs> nice i am going to have to text that to my friend who is currently 12 weeks pregnant yes. making, That's making fantastic. a human out of leftovers i love that oh goodness but speaking of being a parent as the mom of a little girl heroines are incredibly important to me women taking charge of the creative process is a wonderful thing to see so if there is one piece of advice that you could pass on to the next Mary Shelley, the next Jane Austen, the next Claudia Gray, that little girl who's just starting to write her own stories or continue the stories of her favorite characters, what would you want to tell her to help her begin and then continue her journey as a creator? I think I would say that the number one thing, and, and this is not just to, to, you know, this is to everybody, um, but 
learning to write has a lot to do with discovering who you are as a writer. And you, you find out what kind of stories do you love? What are you drawn to? What are the common elements between a lot of these stories? And I've sat down and done that with like the, you know, the TV shows have been crazy about like, okay, what do they have in common? What are some elements? What are these things that draw me in? Um, and um, I guess, honestly, like, don't be afraid to believe that you could do this. I really spent a lot of years not thinking that being a novelist would be a thing that was remotely possible for me because it just seemed so far away. Even after I sold my first books, I thought, well, I'll never be able to be a full-time novelist, you know, and I think I quit my day job 14 years ago now. Um, mm. If I ever have to go back to an office, I am so screwed. It's <laughs> bad. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, these things are possible. This is not... Uh, these people who are writing these things, they're storytellers and they're fans just like you. They're just like you, you know. Like, dive in. Believe in yourself. Give it a try. I know that's very vague, but, but no, that's, that's what I would tell my younger though. self. I would not have to tell the younger Jane Austen anything because <laughs> contrary to, like, Victorian, like, they used to play, like, oh, she was this sweet, retiring little lady. You know, she was always funny, and she was always spicy, and she was very, very serious about her work and mm -hmm. as a business person uh, with her work. She was proud of that money, and she should be. Absolutely. All right, so Claudia, we have one final question for you. We like to call okay. it our silly question uh, because okay. we think that there should always be a little bit of silliness added into things. And one of the silly questions that we were, we used to ask everybody a different question for a while, but we settled on one question because we feel that okay. people just don't get asked this anymore as adults and they should be. Okay. Claudia Gray, what's your favorite dinosaur? Ooh, um... The first thing that came to me was a Triceratops, and I'm kind of surprised by that answer, but I'm going to stick with it. I can't really, uh, I, I don't know why, but that's the sure. first thing that came to mind. I mean, it is the coolest one when you have the little plastic toy. That's true. Right? Because it's got the three horns that, and, and, and a fetching rough, you know, it's, um, you know, for that, that bit of fashion kind of yes. dinosaur, like but make it fashion. We're so yeah, be like I, I, think it's a I did not know that about myself. So thank you. That's fantastic. Uh, because yeah. that was also my answer a little while back. With those triceratops. So yeah, we're going to be BFFs. You, Kathleen? Mine's the Parasaurolophus, the, the ones with the, the big trumpet heads. Oh, that's a, that's like a classy answer. Like they're answer super fun. About dinosaurs. They are super fun. Yeah. I'm also, look, my daughter. Look at me. Oh, I know how to pronounce dinosaur names. Oh. Well, have you been watching? my daughter's going to be five in a month. Of course, I know how to pronounce dinosaur <laughs> names. Do you, what, do you have Apple TV? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Yeah, I've been watching some prehistoric planet. That oh, is, no. uh, that's cool. a fun kind of like winding down for the evening thing because you've got all these wonderfully CGI'd dinosaurs living the way they now think they lived. Yeah. Uh, yeah, every once in a while, like a baby dinosaur gets in trouble. And I'm always like, it is a fictional baby dinosaur that <laughs> even if real would have been dead for 200 million years, you know. Um, it's not I little fun. Myself down. <laughs> Timothy. <laughs> Too soon. Oh, You're welcome. All my husband has to say is tree star. Mm hmm. Sorry. The emotional trauma is deep in the 90s, kids. Gosh, that's mean. Yeah, at, at Jurassic Park came out while I was a waitress at Applebee's. So there was a lot of going with co-workers to a thing now lost to time, the Dollar Theater. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, so I guess it actually been out for a little bit because it had gotten to the Dollar Theater. But we would smuggle in like a six-pack of beer. And I mean, I've seen Jurassic Park a lot. a lot it's a classic we would all say in unison clever girl <laughs> i actually have a friend who just posted today that he was watching his original 
VCR, his VHS copy of it. Oh, he's wow. got he's got a VCR that still works, and he's like, I don't want to watch it in 3D. I want to watch it on my VHS. I'm like, it I'm have to go up and works. adjust the tracking every couple minutes. Right? God, I used to have so many videotapes with all these mm-hmm. X-Files episodes on them. Oh, man. <laughs> and now they're available to stream. Yes. Ta-da. <laughs> and they pause way easier. Yes, they do. Oh, Claudia, we have enjoyed our conversation with you so much today. Where can our viewers and our listeners go to find out more about your work and what you've got coming? Because we know you've got good stuff coming. Um, my website is badly in need of updating, but still, if you go to ClaudiaGray.com, and that's gray with an A, uh, you'll get links to some of the other social media that is going. I'm not super active on social media, uh, but my, uh, wonderful assistant, Sarah, keeps things updated with my appearances and book releases and things like that. And, um, you know, you do see me occasionally on Instagram and I'm one of the 24 people still on Tumblr, uh, if you really want. And yeah, and I'm supposed to be using all my social media professionally. Yeah, that uh, every once in a while, Star Wars or Jane Austen will show up on my Tumblr, but mostly it's just a Tumblr. (laughs) Fair enough. All right. But right. yeah, my website will get you to whatever you follow. And thanks to Sarah, that should have the information you need. Oh, and I didn't even mention, I got a book coming out uh, Tuesday. <laughs> oh, okay. The Haunted Mansion, Storm and Shade. All right, excellent. Um, That'll be Tuesday, August 29th, I think. Sounds about right. Yeah, so that may be, I don't know when this is going to air, but uh, anyway, that is there. It is a young adult novel about a young girl who suffers greatly from anxiety here in New Orleans. And her family's just moved to a new house, and she's going to have to deal with a new school, and it all seems like too much to deal with. But there's something down the block that's going to give her a lot of perspective on fear oh. in short order. That sounds well, awesome. Well, be sure to put a link for that. Uh and in the notes when we put this episode out so that people Great, uh, thank you. Can, can check out that book as well. Definitely. Yeah. Hey guys, uh, just want to remind you that subscribing is the single most important thing you can do to ensure that we get more amazing guests like Claudia Gray here to have these fantastic conversations and, and give you things to laugh about and to enjoy. So please subscribe. It helps out well more than we can tell you and go check out her website and she's got the new uh, Haunted Mansion book coming up. So you guys are going to want to check that out as well. However, If you are not happy with the content of our show today, please feel free to lodge a complaint with the head of our complaint department. That, of course, is Claudia's editor. Although Claudia may not make mistakes, we do quite frequently. So we worry about those who have that giant delete key at their beck and call. So send two copies of your complaint form to her editor. One for the file and one just in case. You know, Claudia's dog eats it. Either way, they'll bring their giant delete key to the source of the complaint, being Kathleen or I, and make the issue go away. Now, we're not saying that they will kill us, but we aren't saying that they won't kill us. But we are saying that they are going to make the problem go away. And they have the giant delete key. So take that information to mean what you will. (laughs) All right, guys, that's going to wrap us up for the FSF podcast. Goodbye. Copyright 2023 FSF Podcast. Reference to any specific product or entity mentioned on this podcast does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by FSF Podcast. The views expressed by the guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact us via email at info at FSFpodcast.com. Original music by Jordan Michaels.